So join me in welcoming Mike Walsh, and he'll be speaking with us about advancing the rule of law. All right. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Ken. Uh, very nice, uh, warm introduction. And it's such a pleasure to be here in North Carolina. I love coming down here. Um, one of the reasons I love coming down here is the weather. Right? It's just, it's like almost perfect out there. Nice blue skies, no interruptions. Quite a contrast from what I experienced in New York earlier this morning when I was supposed to come down here. And I had a flight that was scheduled for 1230. Thunderstorms came up. That got canceled. Then I got on another flight, that got delayed, so I spent most of the day either in the airport or on the tarmac, and I arrived here just about 15, 20 minutes ago, so perfect timing, just, <laughs> just in time, but it is, it's great to be with you guys here. Uh, I'm going to go through um, a little bit about LexisNexis and the company, but more importantly about um, our mission, which is to advance the rule of law around the globe, and the idea that together as actors, universities, students, law firms, institutions can actually have transformational impact uh, on the world. And as part of that, I'm going to go through what, is the, what, what do we mean when we talk about the rule of law? What's its definition? Why is it important? How does it have impact? And what can we do together uh, to advance it? Sound good? Yeah? Okay, let's start a little, with a little bit about LexisNexis and importantly, the partnership that we have with NC State, which we value greatly. I don't know if you guys know, but we've actually been a partner here since 2014, which is when we first opened up uh, our doors on campus here. And um, we are proud to have launched the Innovation Studio that was, uh, that was referred to, where we worked uh, together on innovations. Um, we met many of the students through our hackathons, um, usually on the weekends, and actually we're going to have the, um, the five winners from the October hackathon are going to come up um, to meet with me and my team in New York City, and we're going to do a little Shark Tank-like uh, experience with them, so that should be a lot of fun. Um, we're the largest employer, actually, on, on the campus with about 700, is it correct me, if, is that correct? Yeah, the largest? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so we are the largest employer on the campus. And we are um, really proud to be part of the Triangle community. And um, we've been a long-term sponsor of the Ironman. And we've um, uh, done the American Heart Association walk recently. So we think it's very important for us to be involved there. Those are all key parts of our culture and the company. A little bit of overview of um, our business. We have uh, about 10,000 employees around the world. And they really are spread out uh, all around the globe. We operate in about. 130 uh, countries. Um, about two-thirds of our employees are here in the U.S. and the balance are spread out um, uh, around the rest of the world. We have about 2.2 billion in annual revenues and three petabytes of uh, uh, legal and news data. Um, by reference, that's about 150 times the size of Wikipedia, just to put it in context of sort of the size and scale of the information and data that we like to play around with. We're a leading provider of legal, regulatory information and analytics um, that we help combine with technology to solve customer problems. And we talk about helping improve customer outcomes. And if we can improve our customers' lives and increasingly their economics, uh, that's actually what returns those customers to us. But underlying what we do fundamentally is our mission to advance the rule of law around the world. And everything we do, every time we put out a case, every time we put out a technology tool that helps build out the legal infrastructure around the world, we're helping with that mission. And that's mainly what I'm going to talk about today. So first, what is the rule of law? How do we define it? Lots of different organizations will define it. You hear about it in the news. You see it in the papers. You see um, comments on it by politicians. A lot of people talk about rule of law. And if you look at actually all the definitions of the rule of law, UN puts out a definition. Government institutions put out a definition. If you look at that and boil it down to the components, the components of the rule of law are largely similar. So I've looked at them all, and they almost all contain elements of these components. First, everybody's equal under the law. Everyone gets equal treatment regardless of where they come from, regardless of their socioeconomic status. 
Second, you need a strong and independent judiciary that is and acts as a check on executive and other power. Third, you need accessible legal remedy or remedy that's available on a widespread basis and people have the ability to access it so that they have an ability to get justice when they need it. And fourth, there's transparency of the law, that laws are clear and visible and people can see it and understand it and then therefore have a basis on which to achieve access to legal remedy. And so in general, the stronger any one of these components and the stronger the four of them together, the stronger the rule of law in any particular state, any particular country uh, or jurisdiction. So that's the definition of rule of law. Now, how do you measure rule of law? Well, the best place that I've seen that we've been able to find that systematically measures the rule of law is an organization called the World Justice Project. And this is a nonprofit organization, um, and it created something called the Rule of Law Index. And the Rule of Law Index measures the degree of rule of law in many, many countries around the world. And what it does is, it's, is it does its work in 113 countries. And it looks at 44 indicators in eight categories. And they balance survey work with actual um, firsthand research where they go out and talk to about 110,000 citizens across all these countries to measure different components of the rule of law. And the components are largely subsets of the four component definitions that I showed you. So they go out and they do this work to assess how different countries score in the rule of law and how strong they are. And this chart shows you the results of the 2016 scores and the rankings. And what they do is they put it on an index from 0 to 100, or 0 to 1.0. And the, in 2016, Denmark actually scored at the top of the list. It was ranked at 0.89 out of 1, or 8, 89 points out of 100. And Venezuela uh, ranked last, and it was um, 0.28. And many of you probably read about a number of the um, political and civil problems that are quite graphic in, in Venezuela. The United States came in uh, uh, 18, towards the top of the list, but not, uh, not number one. Now we asked ourselves, well, what's the relationship between rule of law and things that are associated with good economies and good societies? <laughs> so we asked ourselves, what's the relationship between rule of law and economic development? So what we did is we did a little bit of work and plotted out all the different countries on an index. So the bottom of the chart, the rule of law index, just shows you where each of the countries, each of those dots is where each country's uh, uh, plotted out. And on the left, we plotted out GDP per capita, gross domestic product per capita, a measure of sort of the economic wealth in a society per person. And what you can see generally is that the stronger rule of law in the countries, the stronger the economies as reflected by GDP per capita. Now, it's not a perfect relationship. These things never have a perfect relationship, but you can see a reasonably, reasonably close uh, correlation between the two. So rule of law is associated generally with higher levels of economic development. And then we said to ourselves, um, well, what, is the, what do the countries look like that are plotted there? So you, as you can imagine, on the bottom part of the chart, the lower left hand side, you see countries like Afghanistan, Cambodia, Pakistan. These are countries that um, are often subject to um, civil rights abuses. Uh, many of them are war torn. Um, and on in the upper right, you see many of the advanced industrialized European countries um, and some Asian countries like uh, you see uh, Japan up there and, and Singapore. Um, probably not all that surprising. Here, interestingly, is where the U.S. and China um, stack up. So you can see um, the U.S. Is, scores much higher on the rule of law index than China and also much higher in GDP per capita. And there, you read a lot about um, competitive dynamics with China and the U.S. and the fact that Chinese growth rate has been at 7% and now it's sort of gradually coming down a little bit compared to the U.S., which has been more around in sort of the 2% range. And so people tend to talk about China's economy is growing much faster 
But if you put it in the context of GDP per capita, or actually wealth per person, which you can see is today, actually, the US is about seven times the GDP per capita of China. Now, China's trying to get up that, up that curve. And I would posit to you that whether and how fast it can move up that curve and whether it can continue to progress and, and move up um, into a GDP per capita that approximates what you see in the US and Europe, uh, in part, in, in a significant part, depends on uh, whether and how it can address rule of law. And that is something you hear being talked about in, in China. So then we said to ourselves, well, all right, there's a relationship between economic development and rule of law. But what about other indicators in society? So we looked at different correlations. We just sort of gathered up data sources that we could find from publicly available data about these countries, and we plotted it up. We're a data company, right? So we have to look at data. Uh, nothing, nothing happens unless it's, uh, it's you know, looked at with data. And what we found is that higher rule of law on the bottom, higher rule of law index, is associated with lower child mortality. So as rule of law increases, child mortality tends to drop. Higher rule of law, lower levels of homicide. High rule of law, lower levels of corruption. Higher rule of law, um, higher life expectancy. Right? Again, none of the correlations are exactly perfect, but you can see a fairly clear associated relationship between the rule of law and economic development and societal indicators. And what that data shows is probably what most people just know or feel intuitively, which is that if a society doesn't have a clear standard of rule of law, if there, aren't, if there isn't an ability to have clear and safe contractual commitments, protection of intellectual property, and protection against civil rights abuses, countries have a hard time developing both economically and with social indicators. So the data just sort of bears out what you would probably just guess naturally. So that's a bit about what is the rule of law. And it's a bit about why is it important. It's important because it's associated with positive benefits in society. So then we ask ourselves, all right, well, how do we actually improve the rule of law? And what can we do to advance the rule of law? And for us, for LexisNexis, this is at the core of what we do uh, every day. And our, this is what shapes our mission. And we actually work on moving each one of those components of the rule of law. And I'll give some illustrations um, about some of the work that we do and some of the work that others do around that. So first of all, one of the, one of the, um, com uh, the components is equality under the law. Remember the, the four components, right? We're, we're under equality. And one of the um, uh, things that we've done that, that helps support equality under the law is something called the Eyewitness to Atrocities app. And we partnered with an organization called the International Bar Association to develop and put this uh, app out. And it's the first app that actually allows you to safeguard, store, and lock in images that can be used in a court of law. Um, many of you may remember um, that sort of dramatic moment when, after the Syrian chemical attack, uh, Nikki Haley, UN ambassador, stood before the UN. And she made a very, very strong plea and held up pictures, graphical images of children that have been impacted by that attack and urged nations not to turn a blind eye. Every, you remember that, uh, that scene? But what you might not know about that is that most of the images that she held up can't actually be used in a court of law because their authenticity can't be verified. So the eyewitness app changes that and it creates a mechanism that date stamps and creates an authenticity mark that allows these images to be entered into the rule, in, into a court of law. And it's now available um, in about 130 countries around the world and the downloads of it are growing uh, every day. Independent judiciary. Well, how do you promote independent judiciary? And what can we do as, a, as an organization, as a company to drive independent judiciary? So one thing we do is we provide legal materials and training to courts in about 100 countries to strengthen the skills and training of the judges in the court system. Um, this is a picture from, uh, we recently made the laws of Rwanda available online for the first time. And that has been 
a key enabler of legal reform as that country continues to heal from the 1994 genocide. Accessible legal remedy. One of the areas that we've focused on here is human trafficking. And we know that about 21 million people are victims of human tra trafficking uh, around the world. And anybody who stared into the eyes of one of these victims can only imagine the horrors that they have undergone. And for us, we concentrated our efforts on working with attorneys general across uh, the country. And we helped um, shape model laws and help get those laws enacted and passed and provided support for that to happen. And you can see some of the results that have occurred working in partnership with attorney generals across the world. The number of um, uh, laws, state laws, that are ranked as excellent by Polaris, which is a, a non-government entity that does this, that ranks laws, has gone up from 11 in 2011 to 43 in 2017. Now there's still a lot more work to be done, but there's been good, strong progress in this area over the last six years. Transparency of laws, right? Laws must be clear, they must be transparent. And as I mentioned, we have a database that provides transparency into the laws in 130 countries, and that database is 150 times the size of Wikipedia. By the way, it's doubling every three years, just to give you a size of sort of a sense of the, the scope and the rapidity with which this is moving. And our mission is to make the world's laws available and transparent to everybody. And we recently were working in the Maldives. Rough assignment, right? I guess nobody here would really complain about being sent, out to, being sent out to work in the Maldives for an assignment. And so we worked to help the Maldives consolidate and publish their laws. And this is the first time uh, that it happened in, in the Maldives. And that alone, by the way, can be transformative in, in a society. And in the course of doing that, um, one of our team members discovered that their local language didn't have a word for as amended, which is critical if you're going to publish and consolidate and then act on laws. You have to know if the law was amended or not. So we helped uh, the country develop a word for as amended called ISLA. And we stood proudly in Parliament the day that that was enacted. In Myanmar, we worked on constitutional reform. And we actually um, um, sponsored and, and held the first um, seminar for their lawyers on constitutional reform. And we watched that day in the seminar as the mood went from tentative uh, to empowered. A tremendously empowering impact. China and Saudi Arabia, you might think, well, it's sort of puzzling. Why are, why are those countries uh, on the list there? And they're, you know, they're not democracies. Well, our belief is that helping create transparency in the law is a key step in any society on that journey into rule of law. And so we're actually working uh, with both China and Saudi Arabia in building out and helping them create transparency into a legal system. So our mission is to continue to extend and make the world's laws available to everybody. And we're gonna continue to expand our resources there until everybody in the world has clear and visible connection to and transparency into uh, the laws. And we're using technology to extend that. And we are not just publishing laws, but we're making accessibility much easier and we're making the ability to get legal answers much faster. And these are just some of the areas of investment that we have made to help extend transparency of the law through technology investments. So we've done data-driven decision-making, invested, invested significantly in skills developing, development particularly around artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies. We have a LexisNet accelerator that's cultivating startups. Um, we're working with agile methodologies, artificial intelligence, and largely um, in the cloud. Together, we've invested about $1.2 billion uh, in these areas to really make a push to help us um, accelerate the technology and our ability to create transparency through technology. Here's one of the things we're working on right now, which is legal answers. <clears throat> so today, we actually can answer basic legal questions um, 
electronically. So if you have a basically a question like, what is the precedent for dog bites? You can either enter that into our system or you can actually ask Alexa in production mode and it will tell you. Um, now, that's a basic legal question. But what we're working on right now is to move up the value chain, right? increasingly around more business-like questions. How much will it cost to litigate? And ultimately, we want to have complex questions so that we can really make more efficient, streamline, and free up time for lawyers to provide human judgment um, rather than working just through basic uh, question and answer. And we're going to continue to do this work until we really can answer just about every legal question. And by the way, a lot of this work is being done um, right on campus here um, by some of the 700 people that, uh, that are working on, um, in the organization here. We're also um, buying companies that do this. And so this, these are just a few examples of companies that we've acquired over the last few years that have expertise in AI and machine learning that are helping us build out this capability and this skill set so we can take this to the next level. One of them is Lex Machina. They're based in Silicon Valley. And Lex Machina helps you actually predict how opposing counsel or judges are going to behave through data-driven analytics. Intelligize, which is based in uh, Virginia, um, helps you to automate pieces of a transaction. So increasingly, we're taking the, the transactional workflow that an attorney does and automating that to make it easier and more efficient. And Ravel is another um, San Francisco-based company. And uh, what they do is they help litigators automatically formulate arguments. And actually, we were just talking about that. This is um, um, some of the work that we, that we do there. So uh, those are just some examples. There, there are others, too. We're also incubating startups. We have an accelerator program um, to help startups get off the ground, to help them build scalable and sustainable businesses that are helping to drive the mission that we have of advancing the rule of law in one way or another. And the startup, the, the accelerator is actually launched out of our um, Silicon Valley shop. Uh, it's run out of the company we acquired called Lex Machina, which is right in Silicon Valley. And we've added a bunch of startups in Silicon Valley. We've, we've added startups in the Triangle area. We just added um, these two here. So if you go by our offices, you actually might see people from these startups actually wandering through the offices because one of the things we do is we provide mentoring and coaching, but we also provide office space for people to come and work in. And that's also a big benefit for us too because it helps us just stay current with any new cutting edge thing that somebody's doing. We can see what they're doing and maybe we, got, we, maybe we can adopt it or use it or leverage it some way. But we know that really to move the needle on the rule of law, it's not just about what we do internally, but the biggest impact we can have is actually um, partnering with others, just like that example I gave you with the Attorney General is where we worked on human trafficking laws. And one of the things we did a couple of years ago is we partnered with the United Nations. This is um, Ban Ki-moon, the head of the UN at that time. And he was, um, we did an event together to really shine a spotlight on the rule of law. And we launched something at that event called Business for the Rule of Law. And what Business for the Rule of Law is, it's a framework for how businesses can conduct themselves. Businesses spend a lot of money, we hire a lot of people, and the way we conduct ourselves says a lot about the rule of law and how we conduct rule of law around the world. So we provided some guidelines and framework through the UN that helped support the rule of law, that provided clear guidelines around accountability, certainty in the law, promoting equality, promoting human rights and protecting human rights and supporting access to justice. And these were guidelines that general counsels can use with their companies to ensure that companies are adhering to the right level of standards. So that's about how we can move the rule of law. And some examples of actions we can do to promote equality and promote transparency and create some guidelines. But what does it really mean What's the impact of it? We asked ourselves that question, and we struggled with this question for a little while. And being a data company, well, we, we had to look at the data. And we took some of that modeling I showed you that showed the correlation between the rule of law and economic development and social indicators. And we said to ourselves, well, what's the impact if together, by moving the needle with our partners, we can shift the rule of law by and improve it by 1%. If we can improve the rule of law index worldwide by 1%, what would be the impact statistically between that and the various indicators that we, we looked at? And so statistically, based on the correlations we, we showed, 
if you move the index by 1%, um, GDP per capita goes up uh, worldwide by about $676, which is actually, by the way, more than the GDP per capita in some places. Homicides decrease by about 0.2 per 100,000. Child mortality rates increase by about 1 per 1,000. And average life expectancy increases by about 0.2 years. That's an impact. That's a positive impact. Then we said to ourselves, well, what is the impact if we can move the rule of law index by 10% and do that on a global basis? And by the way, all these, um, these figures, these, these are on a tool that our team developed. So you can, you can play around with this tool. It's on our website and, uh, and scroll back and forth to just see the various correlations. But I'll show you at 10%. So the 1% on the bottom goes to 10% <coughs> on the tool. And what does that mean? That means that GDP per capita statistically would go up by $7,000 per person. Um, and homicides would decrease by one per thousand. Child mortality rates, well, by the way, that's an improvement of about uh, 30%. Um, child mortality rates would decrease by 7.9 per thousand. Um, and average life expectancy would increase by about 2.3 years. So that translates into millions of children's lives being saved, uh, millions of people, fewer victims of homicides, and improved life expectancy. So this is a future that we think is worth pursuing. And this is in part why we're so motivated to advance this mission, because we understand why it's important, we understand how we can impact it, and we, can, we understand the positive impact that it can have on the world. So you know, if a, if a nation's laws are muddy, if there isn't a strong independent judiciary, if the laws are not clear and transparent, citizens of those nations will suffer, and then we're all at risk. And that's why we feel very, very privileged and honored to work in a company that truly has a higher purpose, and that purpose for us is to advance the rule of law. So I would encourage you to um, join us uh, in this mission. And if you're interested in the Business for Rule of Law framework that I um, discussed and shared with you that we jointly rolled out with the UN and with Ban Ki-moon, you can find that on the LexisNexis.com website. You can download that and take a look at that. Um, if you want to play around with the Rule of Law Impact Tracker and see the different data correlations and get more information about the data and where it came from and how we looked at it, you can also go to LexisNexis.com and look for the Rule of Law Impact Tracker. And importantly, um, if, you, if you're interested in having a dialogue with us about um, joining us in this mission, we would be honored and thrilled to have that discussion with you. And you can go to our LexisNexis.com website to the US Careers uh, section there. And uh, I think we already have one recruit over here, the guy in the, who answered the trivia question, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if he knows the answer to that, I'm sure you can solve uh, advancing the rule of law for us. So that's, um, that's all I wanted to share with you. And let me um, pause and see if there's any questions. All right, so if you have any questions, if you'll raise your hand and we'll try to get a microphone to you, that way we can capture the question on video. So I think they're all on the other side. You'll be a video star. Uh, yes, I was interested in in the beginning of your presentation. We went over several charts that demonstrated a strong correlation between rule of law, especially GDP. Um, would you say that there is a causal relationship between rule of law and increase in GDP? So you know, it's hard to say if there's a real causal relationship or not. Clearly, they're associated there, mm -hmm. um, and that's I think about all we can conclude. Uh, we're not social scientists. Um, we're business people. And what we can see is that uh, what we're doing and the rule of law is associated with good things. And so that makes us motivated. Cool. Thank you. Um, hi. So my question was, um, 
Or I was really interesting when you mentioned like the third world countries, especially that advancing the rule of law helps in. And I was wondering if um, like using technology solely to advance the rule of law would ever like further leave behind those countries, or like if there were problems that you guys encountered like getting technology into those areas or like how that worked? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think, you know, you can, you can advance interests and help with technology and without technology. We do both, right? So we, we're both on the ground helping um, write constitutions. We're helping with constitutional reform conventions. We're providing um, uh, legal, legal materials um, to help, you know, courts and judges. Uh, but we're also then helping move some of the countries up the technology curve because technology ultimately makes transparency and visibility more accessible and cheaper um, across the board. And so if we can bring that and we can leverage that, um, then we can extend the range at which we, uh, we, can, we can operate and we can, and we can reach. So I do, I do see um, an opportunity for both. more about the access about accessibility because it seems like there's a couple of dimensions there one of them is can people actually get to a court can they get a lawyer and so on but then there's other questions of you know the complexity of the law right how much effort does it take to actually determine the answer to any given question have you done any work on looking at legal complexity or what you know economic legal theorists look at the consequences of various legal alternatives in terms of who pays the cost and externalization? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, by the way, of course you'd have to have a professor ask, ask a question like that, right? <laughs> um, I think that, in general, as you make things um, less complex, as you make them easier to do, um, you extend the reach of, at which people can actually access justice, get information, get appropriate legal advice, et cetera. That's, a, that's sort of a concept in theory, right? But we've seen, that, we've seen that play itself out. We've seen that in terms of the impact that technology's had in terms of the greater reach of accessibility to courts. Accessibility to courts today is far greater than it ever has been. It's not where we want it to be. And as you can see, in the U.S., it's actually not the best in, uh, in the world. But it's far greater than it's been. And a part of that story certainly has been electronic docketing, um, um, electronic discovery tools, um, uh, the ability for people. We, um, we have uh, prison kiosks, um, for example, where we actually have, in prisons, we have um, access to our databases for free. Um, and so it just helps create visibility through technology. Now, none of that would have been um, available you know, before technology. Each of those things boils down um, um, complexity. Each, every time you boil down complexity, in theory, you get lower costs and you therefore extend to greater numbers of people. Let's see who asks the harder questions, the teachers or the students? I'll bet it's the students, actually. Uh, my question is about the, um, you, you mentioned like, Alexa-like or yeah. you know Google Home-like AI to help answer legal questions. Yeah. I know a big problem with human legal advice is you know having to say disclaim like you know this is not a paid law service you know use with it. Do you have that sort of legal problem with offering like AI-based legal advice or something? So like we that? we don't because we offer this advice to lawyers. Mm -hmm. Right, and so we're pro we're providing help for the lawyer and, and the lawyer answering the question. So we're not we're not providing that advice directly to the end customer or the consumer or the consumer of legal services. We're providing it directly to the lawyer, and the lawyer then applies their judgment. Now, you know, the question I think really will become over time: where does that line blend? And um, as far as we can see, sort of in the near term, we don't see. Um, um, ever crossing over that, uh, that boundary, you know, sort of over the sort of five to 10 year horizon. But things are gonna, are gonna develop and we'll probably have to grapple with tough issues like that um, over time. Um, but you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I was talking about this question just the other day with somebody who, um, who said, well, you know, it's kind of like on the Starship Enterprise. You know, the computer can answer any questions, right? 
and it can sort of tell you anything. And then, but there actually are still lawyers in whatever, the 25th century. When is Star Trek in the, what century is it? 24th? All right. Yeah, there's still lawyers on board there, right? Hi, uh, I was wondering if maybe you could speak a little bit to uh, the tension between being a, uh, a business and attempting to accomplish uh, what is presumed to be an ethical goal, especially in places where uh, the money might not necessarily be on the side of improving rule of law. Yeah, yeah. So there is, there is a tension there. Um, I wouldn't say that there's a conflict in the sense of, um, you know, there's, there's no case I'm aware of where the decision is to do something unethical or, or ethical. The, de the decision is usually where you're going to get your biggest bang for your, you know, the, the biggest return for your investment, right? And so almost everything that we do gets an ethical return for, for its investment because what we're doing is, as a commercial business is advancing the rule of law. That, that there's also a lot of other problems that we're not necessarily solving. The world's a big place, right? There's a lot of people who are involved in advancing the rule of law. There's a lot of partners out there, and we can't solve everything. And we're not going to go after everything because we are a commercial business. So there are, there are sort of, you know, um, tensions associated with where do, we put, where do we put our return. And because we are a business, we put return where we're going to get a economic payoff, which then allows us to expand our resources and move into other places. And that's what creates a sustainable opportunity. We do work with many, many other partners helping them. We work with NGOs. We work with nonprofit organizations uh, around the world. We work with the United Nations to help advance areas where we might not be able to get an economic return in doing that. Great question. Yeah. Um, one, one minute, wait for the microphone so that we can capture it on, uh, on video. You, you want to be a video star here in this. <laughs> I have a question about your partnership with United Nations. Do you have an office also in Den Haag, International Court of Justice in the Netherlands, or in New York? Do we, do we have an office in the... Yes, because you have office here on campus. Yes, oh yes. We but you have a partnership. Yes, we have, an office, we have an office in New York. It's actually in the uh, United Nations. Uh, right next to the United Nations, uh, maybe, um, I don't know, 10 blocks, ten something blocks. like that, 10 blocks maybe away. We meet with them all the time. Um, our head of um, communications over here, Stephanie Samis, who is with me, actually sits on committees with them uh, all the time, as, long, uh, as well as our um, general counsel. And we work together um, on this initiative that we started. So we, we're a co-founder of it. Um, that doesn't mean we make all the decisions. We, we do that in conjunction with the steering committee that we have, and we work in lockstep uh, with, How with the U.S. How many years? What's that? How many years? Uh, what is it, three years now? Uh, five. Five, five years. Five, wow, boy, time flies. Five years now. And yeah. what's about your partnership with International Court of Justice in the Netherlands, Den Haag? What does it say? Do we have also office in the Netherlands, Den Haag? Well, we don't have an Court office of in the Court of Justice, no, but we work with them. We work with them closely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, does um, advancing the rule of law help with the sustain sustainable development goals of the United Nations? and to help achieve them? Yes, it does. Um, as a matter of fact, it's a key component of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, that umbrella created a framework, and rule of law is a part of uh, the framework that helps support Sustainable Development Goals. So it's completely consistent with that, with that framework. Um, I do believe that rule of law explicitly at the end is not actually explicitly called out in the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, to be honest, there is um, some conflict um, associated with the precise language around that, and in part, that's why sort of separate initiative that rolls up into the framework was important for the United Nations to roll out. Just to maybe a more pragmatic question. What what uh, types of majors would want to work for your company um, 
There's, there are a few things that stand out already, the web development, data management, system management, lawyers, uh, Statistic yes, statisticians. yes, <laughs> yes, and yes, <laughs> okay. yes. No, great question. Am I um, missing something? Um, so we have more jobs than we can fill. Let's just start there, right? We, we have, um, and actually we have our, you know, somebody who used to run our talent development program um, right here, Tiffany Lewis, with us, right? So everybody could get, talk to her. Um, but we have, we have, you know, job postings. We, we have more than we can fill. We have huge demand for people with AI, machine learning, computer science, engineering uh, backgrounds. We have big demand for um, computational linguists. Um, we have big demand for uh, people who have experience in graphic design, web design, ease of use, uh, those areas. But we also have lots of other opportunities too. I mean, we, we're, we're a large business. You know, we have 10,000 people. We have um, functional, you know, every functional area, finance, HR, um, sales, marketing, and we hire people in all those areas. And um, we hire people in all those areas on this campus here. But the, l the biggest area of demand or, that we have is squarely in computer science, engineering, AI, machine learning. Is that fair, Tiffany? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Anything else you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, we're on campus right now. <laughs> You want to talk about the intern program? Um, sure. Uh, we actually oh, I think we, we need a microphone over here for Tiffany. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, we're really, f this year we had 10 interns um, in our office just across the way. Um, all of them were in, mostly in the technology space. We actually also had an HR intern who was fabulous. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, who helped with the campus recruiting, but uh, we actually have made offers to all of our interns, um, which was really important to us because it speaks to our desire to really build kind of a long sustaining relationship with the campus. It also helped that the uh, students we had were really, um, you know, uh, high quality. And, and so, you know, it was really easy to, to get them to come back. And so we um, are growing our office over there, which is the only constraint we have on hiring more. We want to make sure we kind of build the infrastructure of training and development and career progression at the same time as we're bringing people in. So we kind of have a goal to just increase the number of people that we're hiring through campus every year, um, just making sure that, that there's that balance. Five years ago, we had about 20 or 30 people in this area. Now we have 700. That just gives you, and we're continuing to grow. Yeah. Right. Well, I have to get you the mic. So, what exactly has well, uh, okay? Uh, what's been your experience with countries that may not necessarily want to advance rule of law? For example, uh, China might be very adamant against increasing transparency. Uh, and other countries might have be, be adamant against advancing other aspects of the rule of law. Yeah, good, great question. So um, I touched on a little bit of that in the presentation where I talked about working with both China and Saudi Arabia. And it's a bit of a, you know, an interesting area um, because we are approached by both and both are actually interested in building out um, a database, a legal database to make visible the laws that they have. And our point of view is that um, that's an important step in any country. We're not, we're not a political organization. We're not going, we don't take sides or stands. We do help countries create infrastructure with the belief that transparency into what exists can only be a good thing. So, so we're actually working together with the government in China to build out um, a vast, actually historic database. There are parts of it have already actually launched. And we're a little earlier stage in, in Saudi Arabia just because things, they, they can take a while. Um, but we've been in dialogue um, with leaders there for, you know, a number of years. Um, as far as your work in the U.S. goes, um, how has LexisNexis uh, impacted or, um, like, come across the racial bias in our own country, like in our criminal justice system? How do we, how do we address or help. Um, like is yeah, that something so, you come across? So, 
you know, any, any issue that relates to human rights or civil rights uh, is something that can be moved or impacted by the law. And so we don't take any particular position politically. What we do is we help create a legal infrastructure that allows actors to work out and overcome issues uh, over time. So we, we're not going to solve the whole problem, but we're going to be a key part of providing an infrastructure of justice that people can operate on. And our mission is to do that efficiently and make it accessible and easy to use and effective so that people can rely on that. Hi, so during your presentation, you mentioned that the US was number 18 on the index. Uh, what are some of the things that the first 17 countries are doing better, or what are some of the things that we can learn from them? Yeah, um, they, um, some of the countries ahead of us um, have higher scores on accessibility of the courts. Um, so in the US, there are often backlogs in the courts, getting access to justice through the courts, so we tend to score a little lower on accessibility of justice than, uh, than many other, other countries do. Um, there's been um, some countries actually score higher on one, one of the subcomponents of transparency is around freedom of the press. Some of the countries actually are considered to have more open press uh, than we do. Um, so there's, there's a few of, the, of those indicators, but the main driver is around accessibility to justice. So first, thank you for coming tonight. Um, you're a data company, and you talk about the huge investment in artificial intelligence. And the question I have, and the, the interesting thing I've not heard tonight is anything around security. So from your perspective, what is the cybersecurity threat in, in this particular domain? Yeah, so it's, it's something we, we take very seriously, right? Um, uh, there's no CEO that runs any data business that doesn't have security up there on the top list of their concerns. So we've got major investments in it. We have very, very smart people who look at it. We're constantly paranoid that um, we could have a breach uh, or that somebody could get through. Um, we have layers and layers of protection, but you know, at the end of the day, nobody's really safe. Um, um, so it's something we take extremely seriously. Uh, we invest a lot in security. We hire people. Very, very. We, we want the smartest people who are interested in security to come and work uh, for us. Um, we have teams who try to hack into ourselves internally. Um, we do drills around it. We take it extremely seriously. Okay. It looks like we have just about, that was a great set of questions, by the way. Better than the questions I get in my own company. So I gotta say, we got a smart group of people. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.